Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News, brought to you officially from our new unfinished setup here, and I'm so excited to jump right back into it. But first, I just want to say, we've had our merch taken down from the YouTube shelf store. It got flagged for being somehow inappropriate, even though... This is the shirt. So I can officially turn this into an opportunity and say, if you want the shirt that YouTube deemed too spooky for YouTube, just go ahead and go to danielbgreen.com and you can pick up your forever TBR shirt today. For those of you who don't know, TBR means to be read, basically like I am going to be reading until I die and then well after it because we all have just endless lists of books we want to get through. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump on into the fantasy news. And you know we're going to kick it off with some cover reveals today. And I'm very excited to say that our first cover reveal is for Grave Empire by Richard Swan, With cover art by the talented Philip Harris. Taking place in the same world as Empire of the Wolf, this is a new entry in a new series by Richard Swan called The Great Silence, with a publication date of February 4th of 2025, categorized as epic fantasy by Orbit. And this is spectacular. Like, this is a stupefyingly pretty cover. I love it so much, and not just because that looks like a Trolloc head up top. Flintlock fantasy, meaning fantasy that takes place when there's like muskets and cannons going on, I believe to this day is still an underserved subgenre of fantasy, and seeing an author with experience step on into it with such a statement piece of a cover really just gets me excited. I really like how this captures certain vibes from details in the time. Like I'm thinking Ford's theater at the same time that I'm honing in on the fact that there's an armored f***ing shark on this cover. Are you kidding me? We're going to see someone shoot at a shark and it bounce off armor. What? 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 Incredible art reveal. Will it be topped today? Let's see. Shifting gears into major franchise news, for this next cover reveal, we actually have a book that will help you indoctrinate your children into being fantasy fans, which is crucial for my job security, so please do that. And that is because we have gotten the cover reveal for The Little Witcher by CD Projekt Red, illustrated by Giada Carboni. This is going to be a $16 hardcover, putting a Witcher twist on family life. This delightful collection of comics features Geralt of Rivia as your average monster-slaying dad, trying to raise young Ciri to be a good kid while teaching her all about life as a Witcher. A perfect gift for parents and the Witcher fans for all ages, coming out May of next year. And I just wanna reiterate, looks super cute, can't see the inside art yet, so I'm not gonna comment on that. But get them into fantasy young, get them into science fiction young, do what you can, because otherwise, I am out of a job. But from one of my favorite authors currently putting out work, we have also had a reveal from the late, great, not late, what? We have also had a reveal from the definitely still alive Martha Wells. And that is for the sequel for Demon King, Demon Queen, coming out July 8th of 2025. And it's a good cover. I think it specifically does a good job of being a compliment to the previous one, though it's not my personal favorite style. And the first book wasn't my personal favorite book from Martha Wells. So I'm sitting at like a solid five for hype here. I'm hoping the series could pick up maybe become a new fave, but I'm not gonna be betting on it. And I will say in terms of like the actual, like, yeah, the style's not my personal taste, but the actual like quality of the art and display, fucking killer job, Cynthia. And then this last cover reveal comes also with a publication date. And I'm very excited to say, finally, we know when the next Dungeon Crawler Carl book, which is said to be coming out this year, will be being released. And that is going to be November 11th with a pre-order available now. Though, if like many DCC fans, you are a fan of Jeff Hayes' narration and Sound Booth Theater's production, the audiobook will not be available until February of 2025. Now, I think I accidentally called this a cover reveal. We've seen this cover for quite some time, and it fits in with the current original line of DCC covers quite well. Though that being said, I need to go grab them. Damn it, I should have planned this out better. This new hardback run from Ace that I originally kind of trashed for not having as much personality as the original kind of schlocky 
capturing the tone rather well. Uh, 80s style covers for DCC aren't as bad as I thought. In person, the color choice, especially on a shelf with these spines, is gonna be doing a lot of favors for a lot of people. With the Way Modern, this is gonna be me showing just how niche and obsessive my <laughs> interest in bookshelves has gotten as we're planning our new backdrop, but these kind of pop-out colors are gonna be doing really popular probably among content creators and people who just also like having a very pretty shelf, uh, more so than the spines of the original DCC books, which I think, I, do I have? I do have one of those. Damn it, give me a second. Summarizing what I was saying after too much looking through my piles of just unpacked books, this cover, focus, this cover, Definitely better. This spine, a lot less standout. I forgot to even say why I initially thought this was important to say. I have spoken to people in publishing who, yes, now the marketing department and the designers care whether or not a book jumps out on a shelf in the backdrop of a video and they're doing things to try and make sure that like a content creator might want to show this because it has a color that we know pops and is more common for backdrops. So just know that's a thing now. That was not worth it. And yes, I did finally even out the hoodie strings, but not perfectly. But in channel quickie news here, if you're looking forward to the Halloween special here this year, which last year was Mob Psycho, year before that was Uzumaki, this year we will be doing Chuck Tingle's Bury Your Gaze. A local bookshop owner here in Rochester recommended this to me as one of the best places to start Chuck Tingle. So I'm really excited to get into it and get you a review on Halloween. And if you'd like to read along, Get started, start right now. And for those of you that are fans for indie authors breaking into new avenues of success, whether trad or indie, we have exciting news for the author Orion Cahill, who has had tremendous success in the indie space, has reportedly just signed a six-figure deal with The Broken Binding for five novels and four novellas, with Of Blood and Fire, the first book in the deal, set to be published the 2nd of October, 2025, with his entire series getting redone art by Tom Roberts. Now, as often is the case with these indie authors getting signed to these deals, what The Broken Binding is going to be doing is taking his indie published series and getting it the trad treatment. But The Broken Binding is not necessarily a trad publisher. In fact, this is their first ever, we are just signing someone to publish their book deal ever. Like they, they don't do this. Most of the time they take books that are published by trad publishers, give them a bit of an upscaling in terms of how they're presented and resell them to audiences. Now they're just getting into the publishing space. Matt Holland, the founder of The Broken Binding, said about this, at The Broken Binding bookstore, we have championed this series since its independent launch in 2021. And in that time, the biggest obstacle we face has been keeping the book in stock. Now that we're stepping into the publishing industry as The Broken Binding press, it made sense that The Bound and The Broken be our first acquisition to bring it to wider audiences that it deserves and allow readers across the world to discover this sensational series. Broken Binding announced they'd be stepping into this space in August of this year, and it's cool to see that plan come to fruition. What this means to the publishing industry? A small crack that could lead to wider canyons. canyons. But from here, we're gonna go ahead and skip on away from the hardcore book news and instead talk about the wider fantasy science fiction expanse. Starting with a fun little tidbit we got from Ian McKellen about how he brought his performance of Gandalf to life. Specifically, he told EW, I found a recording of Tolkien reading a bit of The Hobbit. It was very useful to hear the smoky voice, very English, rather professorial. Well, he was a university teacher. It was encouraging to me because he was not acting it particularly well, but the idea of it being heard out loud appealed to him because that's what he was doing. It's not that big of an extension from the audio to making it a movie. And of course, he sold the Lord of the Ring film rights, so unlike some of his family, he was happy to think of them as films, although he never saw our vision, of course. And after finding what I believe has to be at least a very similar, if not the same recording of J.R.R. Tolkien reading from The Hobbit. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make, not he. He was looking out of his pale lamp-like eyes for blind fish. I can kind of hear it, specifically in those moments where Gandalf is speaking rather quickly. Fool of a took. Throw yourself in next time and rid us of your stupidity. It does sound a bit more like Tolkien reading from The Hobbit, but if you hadn't primed me to listen for that, there is no way in hell I would have picked this on up on my own. But they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there. 
down at the very roots of the mountain. True courage is about knowing not when to take a life, but when to spare one. For those of you who, like myself, enjoy the extra details you get in like the extended edition commentary for Lord of the Rings, here is a little cherry I am putting on top of your Lord of the Rings knowledge. Actually, Entertainment Weekly is, but I'm conveying it. Conveyed. And in One Piece news, it has been confirmed that the existing One Piece anime, not the new one that's currently being worked on, just to clarify, is going to be getting some touch-ups done to its animation in later arcs. Specifically, re-edited Fishman Island's 58 episodes into 21s with better pacing, with remastered visuals, new OST and sound effects, original soundtrack, and it will begin airing weekly October 27th, which is aligning with the One Piece anime going on break. And with the sneak peeks we have gotten with some of the animation remasters that are happening, it certainly does look like people spent more time on those visuals. Whether or not they're objectively better, I don't think that can exist, but to me they are certainly in these still frames, not the motion we'll see in the anime, uh, more visually engaging. The bigger thing for me though is hearing that some of the pacing issues are going to be corrected because that is honestly what stopped me from continuing the One Piece anime and pushed me into the manga for good. Even when I just started checking in in later arcs, it was just substantially slower, not even like, of course, reading manga to watching a visual, but in the pacing of the story. It was egregious at times, so... Yay for they. And as just a progress update for my book, Better Dead, I recently hit 80,000 words after a whole lot of rewriting, which is frustrating, but necessary due to what I've learned thanks to using Skillshare. Once again, I decided to check out another of Daniel Jose Older's classes, this time Storytelling 101, where he covered the big fours, character, conflict, context, and craft. And with over 54,000 students, I can see why he's so popular. I highly recommend if you're a writer, you check it out. Because as you know by now, Skillshare is loaded with tons of classes led by industry experts, here to help you learn skills through what they share. Turn your I want to's into I made it happens, and they cover everything from publishing to design, animation, illustration, writing, storytelling, and so much more like photography and even lighting. The first 500 people to use my link in the description down below will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. And in that time, you can go from some of their beginning courses all the way to the advanced before breaching out into their skill trees that'll allow you to get a better well-rounded view on a specific topic. And again, it's just the first 500 people, so be sure to use that link in the description down below and back to today's video. And then in quite possibly my favorite story of the day, PBS has given someone their flowers that was long overdue for them. And I'm ashamed to say, I wasn't even aware of this person's existence before checking out this 12 minute video that I, I cannot recommend strongly enough to you all when it comes to seeing someone who has been foundational to not only your reading experience with freaking Star Wars, but also some of the most key and pivotal ideas for some of the most important authors the science fiction genre has ever seen, like Isaac fucking Asimov. Judy Lynn Del Rey, the person who ended up getting their own press that, yes, became Del Rey, was given her own documentary in the series called Renegades. Renegades is a series that PBS is doing within their American Masters program that is highlighting those with disabilities throughout our history that have been foundational to history. And Judy Lynn Del Rey, again, someone I was not aware of before consuming this documentary, absolutely deserves to be an at-home name. And this can even bleed into a conversation about how, yes, we are all fans of authors, but if there's a specific style of writing within a book that clicks with you, it can very often actually be a result of the editor. And we should probably be bigger fans of editors in general. Between 1977 and 1990, Delray Books was so dominant on the science fiction fantasy market that they had 65 different titles reach a bestseller list. That is more than every other publisher in this country combined. An incredibly intelligent, quick-witted woman burning constantly with a bright radioactive glow. She gave Isaac Asimov one of her very close personal friends, the idea for one of his most famous short stories, The Bicentennial Man. Judy saw Star Wars' success coming and is the reason we ended up getting those novelizations released so quickly that were bestsellers. This goes into also an influence that clearly just goes into Del Rey. The name I didn't know was because of her. 
publishing being one of the most successful presses of our time. So if you would like to be informed on someone you should probably know about because they directly affected some of the reading you had in your life, please check it out down below. So much fun after you finish today's news or like watch it in between and then finish the news later. I'm fine with that too. I don't like it when YouTubers are like, ah, oh, after. You could do it now and come back but please come back. But let's go ahead and get the quickie trailer news out of the way. We had a trailer release for season two of Silo, which is a show I started last year just because I wanted to see if Rebecca Ferguson would be an actress that I was super down to be in a Joe Abercrombie adaptation because she was cast in the adaptation of Best Served Cold. And the answer to that is yes. And also you should absolutely watch Silo. It's probably in the top five science fiction shows on TV right now, in my subjective opinion. But we also got the trailer dropping for The Secret of Nima, Masters of Cinema, new and exclusive edition. This is going to be a limited release of a Blu-ray on December 9th of 2024 as a part of the Masters of Cinema series and is limited to only 2000 copies. But this cult favorite from back in the day is getting the full Blu-ray treatment and upscaling with new additional behind the scenes features included. They're going to be upscaling a studio supplied 1080p master and have additional artwork and things so if you are an enjoyer of The Secret of Nim, which unfortunately I've never even heard of before this, but it just looked like they were doing a cool job and I always love kind of lifting up cult hits, uh, go ahead and check this one out. Link in the description down below, just like everything else we talk about here. God damn. And if you have not heard, The Wild. Robot has been taking audiences by storm, at least critically. And now we have officially had it told to us that the Pixar hit is going to be getting a sequel with the original director, Chris Sanders, attached. This is based off of a book, and I don't know anything about the premise, aside from it looks like a lonely robot running around the woods. And I would love for those of you who have consumed both of the story to tell me in the comments down below, should I read the book first? Or is the movie so good? It's like, no, 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 you can actually go there. That is fine. Like Isaac Isamoff and his book, I, Robot, and the movie that changed nothing and is a completely accurate representation of Isaac Asimov's I, Robot. <laughs> now, the reason I bring this up is a complicated reason <laughs> because we have gotten the headline, newly announced Harry Potter TV writer, Andy Greenwald, does not like the idea of rigorous adaptation of the books and said he has not read the books. In a podcast in which he runs called The Watch back in February, Greenwald was asked if he would be possible to directly adapt A.K. Rowling's Harry Potter novels to television. He initially said yes, but then he explained just how popular the novels and franchise are. These are really, really rich, and they are very long books, especially later in the series. People adore them. But he then went on to explain, if something is trumpeting its absolute rock steady faithfulness, I think the pleasures that can be derived from that are probably not going to be for me because I didn't read all the books. I read them to my older daughter until she could read them for herself. And then, she dusted me. And I think maybe there's some other creative possibilities in this world, but JK Rowling controls all of it, and it's not going to let anyone else come play with her toys. And that's her right, and it's obviously very profitable for her. So that's what we get. This goes on for reassurances being had from like HBO that they're going to be faithful from the book, and that's what we're Rowling wants. And in my opinion, this headline phrased what he was trying to say as negatively as possible. And I want to emphasize so goddamn much that he said this, and let's highlight this here, before he knew he was going to be a writer on the goddamn show. <laughs> he said this on an episode of his podcast back in February. And I also want to maintain, he can absolutely have an opinion that I don't need to read source material to then make an adaptation of it. It's something I disagree with, but that doesn't by default mean that this is the practice that's going to be had with Harry Potter show. And I hate that I have to defend this because obviously JK Rowling for all the reasons mold brain, but this like sensational outrage headlineism, it takes all the like humanity out of a situation. And it's like all these months ago, you said this thing in a different context and now you're involved in this. So we're going to put it on you. We should be mad. Why? <laughs> I agree. He should probably read the books now. He's a writer on the show. And you note, he even says in this statement, it's probably a good guarantee of success to do a rigorous, faithful adaptation. And if that's what he's been hired on to do, that's likely the job he's gonna do. And I wanna just iterate this same website that's trying to get people angry about this, the pork place, then just 
seamlessly, so smoothly. Blink and you'll miss it. Transitions from being like, oh yeah, these comments are not going to give you full context of the timeline for. Uh, yeah, also, ugh, the casting calls for this upcoming Harry Potter show. They talk about inclusion and diversity, and that's bad. There's so many red flags. Shut the f*** up. The show's not even been shot yet. It's not been shot. It's not been written. And people are like, well, this one writer said a thing in February that can be taken negatively. Shut the f*** up. Articles like these are designed to make you mad. And they are so paper thin if you push just a little bit through them. And I want you to know, you don't gotta be mad about it. You don't. Not at all. Don't care. <laughs> just, just, I want you to take the last three minutes of your life, however long this story and editing turned out to be, crumple it into a little ball, throw it away. Just to add a nail to a coffin here, nowhere is this person credited as head writer, showrunner, anything along those lines. They don't get to dictate single-handedly the philosophy of how this is done, nor do we know if they've still not read the books, or this is still the opinion they have after being brought on board. <laughs> and in news that kind of made me go, we didn't already know that? Steam has officially told its users, reiterated that uh, you are not owning a game when you buy it on a Steam, you are leasing it. And this is happening because a new law was just passed where uh, digital storefronts like Steam are no longer gonna be allowed to use the word buy, and they're gonna make it clear that yes, you are just leasing a game. Like the whole controversy that happened all those years ago with like Apple iTunes and like, no, you don't own the song, you're leasing it. You can't leave it to someone in your will. And my response to this is kind of just like, I'm not mad at Steam about that. I kind of just assumed like <laughs> all digital content, I don't believe I own by default. And I think most people are aware of that by now. Don't get me wrong. The memes about pirating that have come up around this, I think are funny, but this is like the crux of the whole push right now to preserve the practice of physical media. Digital retailers are 90% of the time not actually selling you something. Thing. And I hate to admit it, but like 80% of the time, that's never gonna really matter to you. For example, there are games in my Steam library I bought back in like high school, middle school, and they're still there and they will be there till I die. And honestly, I'm not gonna tell Steam I'm dead. I'm just gonna give my children my login. It's not gonna affect anybody at any point, but physical media is still important because if you do want to own something, if you want to be irrevocably yours, Buying a physical version of it, a lot of the time, is still the true way to do that. I think like even on Apple and Amazon, when you buy a movie for like the full price, you're not actually buying it. I could be mistaken in those examples, correction on screen now, but just take it to heart. It's a good practice to keep in mind that you do not own things you've purchased digitally. But that is going to take us to today's video game news, clearly, and I'm gonna go ahead and start it off with a pretty interesting story about a remaster for the Laura Croft Tomb Raider series. Tomb Raiders 4, 5, and 6 will be getting a remaster bundled and released together. Launching on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series X and S, One, and PC via Steam and Epic Game Store, February 14th. And if you're looking at the visuals on screen and going, that doesn't look totally remastered, I agree. And I kind of like this approach. If you're going to be remastering a game, I am more a fan of taking its art style and, you know, just making it look as better as you can while maintaining that artistic vision than to try and bring it up to like modern PS5 looking graphics. Uh, that to me can even be detrimental to a game because the visual language of a game can often inform the mechanics of it. And then those mechanics are of course responsible for your actual playthrough and enjoyment. And so if this was suddenly looking like one of the brand new Laura Croft games, I don't think that would actually improve the game. But this way it kind of looks as good as you remember it looking when you played it first when you were a kid rather than just totally trying to make it over and being like up to date to modern standards. So it manages to actually hit this like specific shot where it maintains the nostalgia appeal, the member berries. Yeah, <laughs> member addicts, member? While still being an absolute visual upgrade. And for a lot of games of this era, Laura Crofts included, there are also hitches they're able to fix with these remasters, like it being generally too dark or bad camera angles and improve in these remasters as well, while again, not actually breaking the core game. And while I actually never have played through any of the very old Laura Croft games, I'm now more tempted to than ever to try them out. 
because we all know that there are games that if you go back to now as an adult, no matter how great they were when they were released, borderline unplayable. And for fans of real-time strategy games like myself, we have gotten a pretty interesting trailer drop for Worshippers of Cthulhu, which no, you're not fighting against Cthulhu, and it looks like you will be building a cult that does the worshiping. Coming to us October 21st of 2024, in the whispers of Cthulhu, you decide the fate of your followers, perform eldritch rituals, and master the art of city building in a world where the lines between sanity and madness blur. Coming from Crazy Goat Games and Cryptivo. Cryptiv, I'm not sure about that one. I'm a big fan of real-time strategy games ever since I originally played like Age of Empires 1 and 2 and Age of Mythology. So having a game where like the specific bend of it is not you're like fighting against the Eldritch Horrors, but instead you are making a civilization around it. Hail Satan, I submit to the dark side. And then the last bit of video game news I'm going to be covering here, and I'm going to be depending on you, the audience, to help me learn a little bit. We are getting a spiritual successor to a classic hit game called Disco Elysium, with two of the writers from that game now bringing us Triple X Night Shift, a detective role-playing game described as a deep single-player role-playing experience with many tools and layers of gameplay. Set in 2086, you play as Patrol Op Denora Katz, who is stranded at a luxury ski resort in Antarctica. The original science fiction setting lands you in a resort that shouldn't exist, with people that you shouldn't know, with the endless polar night covering a multitude of sins. I really thought they should have said mountain of sins because ski resort, but... To each their own. Additionally, to innovating the traditional RPG mechanics, we'll bring something fresh to the table. You will see, and of course, a few less words, and a few more bullets, perhaps in total, a lot more fun. It's currently available for pre-order, but when I checked out some fans of these uh, creators on Reddit subreddit and the discussion going on there, I found some interesting comments like, spiritual succession is not about the surface level similarities. You were not a detective in Planescape Torment. The aspects of the main character didn't speak in his head, etc. Nevertheless, Disco Elysium was a spiritual successor to Planescape Torment. Because both games were a deep dive into the character's psyche, mind, and soul, with plenty of philosophical and sociological questions raised, and with unusually high quality of writing. So before I've seen the quality of writing, the themes, and their depth, etc., I would hesitate to name any game a spiritual successor, with the next highest comment reading. So now we have three, cross it out, four alleged successors to ZA slash UM. Five if you want to count the actual ZA slash UM, which technically isn't dead yet. But why would you do that? Long do, Dark Math, Summer Eternal, and Red Info. The last one seems to be the most deserving of that title, since it's where Kurvitz, Rasov, and Hindpeer are. But it's also the one we've heard the least about, with the top response to that being, I'm under no delusion that Kurvitz is a perfect human. And I also believe Disco Elysium was the product of many, many different people working on it in concert. Still, I think Kurtzif is probably the number one most indispensable and irreplaceable guy. And if I'm getting this right, Disco Elysium was a smash hit success of a game upon its release. But the studio since then has had a lot of the creative minds behind it scatter. And those people have gone on to make their own studios and their own games. And many of them are trying to market themselves as the next Disco Elysium or the true spiritual successor. This one, Triple X Night Shift, has the one that some people, at least in this comment section, consider to be the most irrevocable key part of the creative team behind Disco Elysium. And so, what does this all mean? I did a lot of research and I, d I wasn't still sure by the end of it, and I was like, God damn it, I'm gonna include it, but f But in all fairness, if you would like some attention given to some of the rivals who are also claiming to be a spiritual successor here, Longdo is also a new independent studio comprised of staff from Disco Elysium. ZA slash UM, clarifying that's the studio behind Disco Elysium, as well as developers from the likes of Bungie and Rockstar. And they've announced that their first game is going to be a groundbreaking psychogeographic RPG mechanic where decisions made in the narrative will reshape the world and its characters. And the big difference here is I, I don't think they have a title for their upcoming game yet, but which will be the true spiritual successor of Disco Elysium? I'm confused. But let's end the fantasy news with a fairly straightforward and awesome to celebrate story here. And that is going to be a South Korean speculative fiction author has been given the Nobel Peace Prize 
for their writing. Han Kang wins the 2024 Nobel Peace Prize in Literature. I'm so surprised and absolutely honored, Han said in a phone interview shared with the Swedish Academy. I grew up with Korean literature, which I feel very close to, so I hope this news is nice for Korean literature readers and my friends and writers. Han is the first South Korean author and the 18th woman to win the prize. And apparently in response to this news, some Korean book retailers online have just been like hugged to death by people ordering these writers books, which is just awesome. Her empathy for vulnerable, often female lives is palpable and reinforced by her metaphorically charged prose, said Anderson Olson, chair of the Nobel Committee. She has a unique awareness of the connections between body and soul and the living and dead and in a poetic and experimental style has become an in innovator in contemporary prose. And that is a hell of a praise. You know when you hear a praise and you're like, damn, that was complimentary. Calling someone an innovator in prose, I hope to get that on my book one day. It's not going to happen, but I would love to. In 1993, Han made her literary debut with a series of five poems published in the Korean magazine Literature and Society. The following year, she won the Seoul Simonon. I'm sorry. Say that again. Soul Simonans. Soul Simonans. Hello, darkness, hello, friend. Shinmun. Spring Literary Contest with a story called Red Anchor. The Vegetarian was her first novel to be translated into English. It won the International Booker Prize and helped earn Han worldwide readership. Han's latest novel, We Do Not Part, will be published in English in 2025. The story follows a writer discovering the impact of the 1948-49 Jeju Uprising on the family of her friend. The French translation of the novel won the Prix Midis it's, I can't do French in 2023. If you are someone who's getting this level of critical claim internationally, that is going to put it on my radar. I would love to read one of their translated works. And I'm I'm kind of like setting my expectations like once in a generation author. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Thank you so much, everyone who's made the TBRT our best-selling one ever. And like and subscribe if you have not already. Thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring today's video. And I look forward to seeing you all later this week. Have a good one. Peace. Cinnamon, I would say that is not correct. Would you like me to tell the answer? And I would then say it's Shinmun, which I feel like you can say, but none of the none of that conversation happened. <laughs> you're, so just to clarify, you're upset that I didn't come to you with how to read these Korean words when you speak fluent Korean. I'm just, I, I'm, I am fascinated by your brain. <laughs> I.